something that I, I have been dealing with. Uh, I've been kind of intrigued by Arduino, I've been intrigued by Raspberry Pi, I've been intrigued by small devices that allow you to really interact with the physical world, but I am not uh, an electrical engineer. Um, I cannot read a schematic to save my life. Um, I did not feel like burning down my house in an attempt to, uh, to start experimenting with this. So I did what any good red-blooded American male would do, and I convinced my boss to buy the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino, so that way I could burn down the office in case I set things on fire. Um, so this is a new topic for me, um, and so I wanted to kind of step uh, step everybody through the basics of setting up your own Arduino setup, uh, using Python to sort of control it, a very basic environment. We're just going to be doing something like switching a light bulb on and off. Um, but that's really all that the like that's really that's the basis of what an Arduino does is it is it's basically turning switches on and off um, in a sophisticated fashion that you can control with a server. But that's but that's all it's doing. It's switching things on and off. And so I'm hoping to kind of step through this at a very basic level how I was thinking through it um, so that you can go and get your own you know get your own Arduino get your own Raspberry Pi when you come out and. I will actually step you through all the things to do to not set yourself on fire. Um, so let's get started. Um, I, like I said, I can't read schematics, so I drew mine, um, and then I took a picture of it. Um, all we're doing here is that we have our Raspberry Pi, which is going to be taking in signals from the internet. Um, it is connected to an Arduino. Which is passed down here to a, what's a product, an official name of a product called a Power Switch Tail Two, and all this is is that your your Arduino is going to send out direct current signals. It's going to send out uh, it's going to send out DC signals that your light bulb will not run on. They have these little LEDs that you can buy, but that's not a whole lot of fun. An LED is not a fog machine. An LED is not a strobe light. You can't do cool stuff with that. You need to get it on a standard. Um, alternating current plug like that will go into the wall and again that's one of, that's where the whole setting things on fire part starts to really become an issue <laughs> is when you're going from direct current to alternating current you really should know what you're doing um, and so the, some, some good folks came up with a product that says you know what we're gonna let the idiots just plug the two wires into here and then we'll do all of the rest of the work for them um, and so basically it is, it, it simply is, it's taking the, the input wires from an Arduino and is connecting it to a wall and then an output giving you a plug that you can plug things in. Um, so this is, this is an extremely basic version of doing it, but this is just enough to get started. Um, this scenario we've had going on in the office, um, what the specific need for us to build this particular setup was is we had one of our developers moved to Seattle. Um, he'd been in the DC office the entire time. And when he was in the DC office, um, he was able, if he needed something, he could actually flag us down, come over and talk to our desk. Uh, and, and we knew that he could just come and get us, but obviously that was a little bit more difficult when he was across the country. So we built a way for him to turn the lights in the office on and off uh, when he <laughs> needed to get our attention. And so he has, there's a, there's a small website that we've built that's basically firing, it's running off of this Raspberry Pi, and when he presses the on-off button, he can start to flick our lights on and off until we come around and get and, and actually start to say, hey man, what's up, I'm, I'm back on chat, what's going on? Um, so we, we allowed him to be irritating. But again, like I said, this could have been a strobe light, this could have been a fog machine, this could have been whatever device you wanted to hook up, ours is just a standard spotlight. Um, <laughs> things you will need to complete this product. Uh, you're going to need an Arduino Uno. Um, there are plenty of other Arduino products that would do the job. The, the Uno is the one that I'm going with. You're going to need a standard USB cable, uh, which is going to connect to your Raspberry Pi. Um, and you're going to need one of the USB power adapters. We had a slew of... Uh, we had a slew of uh, BlackBerry chargers left over that nobody's really <laughs> using anymore. Um, that actually did the trick just fine. Um, libraries that you're going to need for this product, uh, for Python, you're going to need Flask, and you're going to need a library called PySerial. And what PySerial allows you to do is it basically is just going to send serial signals onto that Arduino. Um, that's, that's all it does. It, it sends serial, serial bytes. Um, and you're also going to need, I did not include it, 
but you're also going to need the Raspberry Pi operating system. Um, there's plenty of operating systems out there. The standard one that the Raspberry Pi group recommends is called Noobs. Um, it's not it's new out of the box system, and it's basically just a Linux distribution. Um, so it's it's easy. It feels like I mean, it's just it's giving you a client that's going to run um, a, a Debian variant, if I remember right. Uh, so it's pretty easy to to kind of get your hands around. Uh, understanding a little bit about what the Arduino did, like I said before, basically all you're taking in, you're taking in a serial input signal, and you're going to be doing it over a USB cable. That's what that's what plugs straight into the Arduino. A USB signal that's going to come from, in this case, our um, our Raspberry Pi, and then there's a little embedded C library um, on that Arduino that's going to be processing that signal. And that C library doesn't do much, um, but what it will do is it's going to interpret which of these which of these switches you want to fire. If you want to turn it on, if you want to turn it off, um, it's going to be able to interpret what you actually want to do based on the signal that it receives. Um, so if you are sending it one serial byte, you can tell it to light switch one. If you're sending it a different serial byte, you can say light switch five and or turn it off. Whatever you want to do with that. So the the goals for what we're going to do with the Arduino is we're going to be initializing initializing a listener on that serial port. We're going to be reading the data as it's coming in, and then we're going to turn that light on and off depending on what we actually receive. Dead simple. This is obviously a conceptual model we can easily get. Um, what does the code look like? Like I said, it's in C. And if you cannot read that, I'm, I've got my slides online. They'll be out there if you want to pick them up later. Um, but basically, the first thing that we're doing is we are initializing the listener in a, in a method called setup. Um, and all we're doing with that is calling serial.begin, and then we're specifying the serial port that, we have to, that we're listening on. Um, that's obviously going to be the same for listening on the on the 9600 port in this example. Then our Python library will have to be sending on the 9600 port. Um, and then we have a loop method, and this is also required by the Arduino. Um, all we're doing here is we're saying that if we get a signal, the serial dot available method, um, we're going to read we're going to read that in. So if we have a if we have that serial port initialized, and we have incoming data then we're going to read that byte as it's coming in. And if the byte is 1, then we're turning the 1 switch on. And if the byte is 0, then we're turning it off. So all we're going to do is that if, if there's no data coming in, nothing's going to happen. The Arduino is going to, it's going to maintain the state that it was just in. If it receives a 1, it's going to turn the switch on. And if it receives a 0, it's going to turn the switch off. If it's not receiving any data whatsoever, it's going to stay what it is, so it can, that light will stay on um, for as long as it needs to, um, because we definitely want to make our guy have to actually press the button on and off, so that, that way he would you know, actually have to work for it. He can't just hit the flicker button and it's going to do it. We're going to actually make him click. Um, so he has to click on and off. Um, but that's like, it's pretty simple, little snippets of C code. I don't, I don't write C. It's easy enough for me to understand. So the first smallest little bit of Python code that I want to write before we do anything cool with it uh, is extremely simple. Um, we're importing that serial library, and then we are initializing a serial uh, a serial port here on the Raspberry on my Raspberry Pi. The USB cable we we're connected to was at uh, slash dev slash tty acm zero. Um, that's going to be different for your machine. I'll tell you how to get to that in just a second. Um, it, but it's going to be one of the it's going to be one of the serial terminals um, that you're going to need to go find. It takes a little bit of experimenting because basically because the Linux system is going to initialize those as it comes in, and if you plug it into a different USB port, you could have a different serial thing. You don't have that many on a Raspberry Pi, so it's a pretty easy system to kind of figure out. Yeah. Yeah. I actually just sneakily sent his slides to you if you have your phone or whatever on you. <laughs> yep. So, can you see that? Good? Yep. Cool. Like I said, yeah, we're just using that serial port, 9600. And then once we have it, once we have that initialized, um, we're defining two functions, turn on and turn off. 
and all turn on is going to do is it's going to write a serial byte one to that to all that on serial port 9600, and turn off is going to write zero. And if you remember going back, we set up that C code to be listening for byte one to turn it on, and by listening for byte zero turns it off. So again, this is the two sides of the equation. Is you've got the Arduino listening for what the Python server for what the Python process is going to send. Like I said, finding your USB serial device, um, just typing on the terminal ls slash dev will give you the list of all of the serial devices that are available. It's probably going to be something like TTY ACM0 or TTY ACM1 uh, because on the our, on the Raspberry Pi there's only two USB ports. It is probably going to be one of those two, unless there's something weird going on. Um, but in, if you have just the basic operating system, the, the noobs downloaded system, then, then that's going to be just enough for you. And like I said, that's just being used to fill out the last part of that serial device there. And so we have a little flask app. Um, let me zoom in a little bit on this guy here. Actually, it's, 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 it's fighting. It is fighting. This is what happens when you have HTML slides. Um, so the way that we built out this flask app, and like I said, and, and Eddie just sent all the slides out if you have them on your phone or iPad or device of choice. Um, we're importing Flask's response and send file methods. We are initializing the app. And then we're taking in those turn on and turn off methods that we just built out. So the first part that we have is we have our index method, which is at, uh, which is at the root directory. And that's basically just the index.html file. That's just the buttons. All those buttons, are, that's, that's all that, that is. It's just the button methods. Um, the on route is going to be a post signal that's going to hit that turn on method. And then the off route is going to be a post uh, post signal that's going to hit that turn off method. That's it. That's all. That's that's honestly just the functions that we just have with a little bit of Flask uh, massaging around it. Um, the other parts are are simple required things for Flask and Raspberry Pi. They're how you set up the web server. Mm -hmm. This will this will likely not be a little be you a know, very different than. Um, then how I've set this up here, it's basically just the code for initializing a Flask app. If you choose to do this in Django or web.py or something like that, then you are going to have a slightly different scenario. Um, but I wanted to include this in case you folks are, are following along at home after the fact, so that that way you can say, oh yeah, I'm going to need this init.py file because that's how Flask wants to set it up. And I'm going to need this WSGI handler that's going to do a little bit of um, appending the path, it, appending those folders to the path, so that way everything will hum on just fine on Apache. Um, and again, same thing. Um, uh, the, I've included the Apache configuration file here. This is boring to read right now. Uh, you will see Sardine uh, specified all over this. We call the project uh, Sardine because the guy who left had this propensity for having sardines with hot sauce for his afternoon snack. Oh. Um, he was really, really into those sardines with hot sauce. Uh, so we called it sardine in honor of our fallen comrade who went to Seattle, where he can smell like fish every day. Um, so I'm not, I mean, this, is, this is the basic setup for a WSGI app with Python. Um, this is nitpicky and irritating to deal with um, with Apache, so I've included what mine looks like on the Raspberry Pi as it might be useful for you as you're kind of configuring up. Yes? Um, Nginx? You know, I, I could have done Nginx with it. I did Apache because I was following a guide on how to do this with Apache, and that was what I, I used. So in, you, if you're familiar with Nginx, I'm not, um, but if you're familiar with Nginx, go for it. Long story short, I, I first tried doing Django with Apache, and mm -hmm. I, I was beginning to lose too many hairs on my head, and I gave up. And then when I switched over to Nginx, I went a lot. So his way might be easier, because I definitely did a lot of that. Um, <laughs> if you're following along, I use the Apache system, and this guy is based on that, but Nginx could be way simpler for doing with Flask. Um, this, guy uses, this guy uses Apache.
Uh, so that's it. Any questions? Yes. Are you using the Arduino because you wanted to, rather than use the digital I/O lines on the Raspberry Pi, or you're following somebody's guide? No, or? we so we actually got the Arduino mm -hmm. first, and it started to set that up to do to basically to see what else we could build with an Arduino, mm -hmm. and then we were running a we were running it off of a leftover computer in the office, and so it's just kind of a situation of things that built on top of each other. So yes, the, the Raspberry Pi does have digital I/O outs. This. We just were using, we started off with another server using Arduino. Right. Yes. Uh, you had the the bit flipper uh, functions returning empty strings. Is that a flaskism or is there? A yeah. Set? So that is what happens on Flask if you don't do that. Is it actually um, it confuses it like something was getting confused to where it was basically clicking the Arduino on and off. I could not ever figure that out, but I knew that returning empty strings actually got me to the end of that. <laughs> was that, so, was yeah, that a view function? It was, yeah, it was in the view function that I couldn't figure out what it was continuing to send on. It was continuing to send data onto the Arduino. Typically, sending like a 200 OK. Yeah. When, when you just send the string, it sends like 200 OK, this is done. But I, I guess when you weren't sending the string, then it was like trying to keep it. Gotcha. OK. It was okay. Until it, it got acknowledged. Yeah. Because yeah. if you just return a string, it uses that as a template. So it basically said, this is the end of this. Ah, okay. Yes? Is there a way to interrogate the state of the line? Um, there is, not with this, with, yeah, with your, with your Arduino, there is a way to query it and, and see what state it is. Um, I am not sure how to do that, but I know you can. Okay. If you were to do it again, would you just do it just on the Raspberry Pi and mix the Arduino? One less piece of hardware? If we were if we were going to do it again, we would. Yeah, we probably would have just done it on the Raspberry Pi again and mixed the extra hardware and used the Arduino for something else. That's cooler. The light and the fog machine. Yeah. Or I mean, the nice thing about the way you got it is that if you had a main web server doing other things, you could have just plugged the Arduino into it and you know jettison you know the Raspberry Pi part. Yep. Like you jettison either one. Mm -hmm. what, what's the uh, location of that web server? Uh, <laughs> internal corporate network. Dang it. Uh, it is not in a domain, it's on the internal network. It's like the new kind of SQL injection. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we're actually, we actually thought about, we're having some FTP problems and our IT department was not being responsive uh, <laughs> because they were doing it on SharePoint. So we said, well, they just uh -huh. want us to keep it on the network. So let's just send these Photoshop files into the, to the Raspberry Pi. So it actually did double as, a, <laughs> as an FTP server for a little bit, just what we needed to send some files from Seattle. <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when your Raspberry Pi is a faster server than your corporate's invested thing, uh, <laughs> the corporate has some issues. <laughs> yes? So the guy you built this for, is this his last resort to get your attention? <laughs> no, he has HipChat, um, and yeah. we've actually thought about streamlining this to where he, to writing a HipChat bot to where he can mm -hmm. actually just tweet at the at the bot to do it, um, <laughs> but we haven't gotten there yet. He has more. What is HipChat? HipChat is uh, it's yeah, a it's yeah. one awesome. Uh, HipChat <laughs> is a typically cloud-based chat system. Uh, it gives you unlimited users that are restricted into a corporate network. It's basically like. Like you set up your own little free node system or IRC system, um, but it does all of the work for you and just gives you a nice little GUI application that you can use to have an internal corporate chat system. Uh, it's unlimited free users, and the only thing you can't do is like you have a limit on how many files you can send, and you can't do video chats. Um, um, but yeah, so you can't do video, but it's, it's all text based chats. We just have a chat room for all of our developers that's set up. Um, and there's also, if you like, if your IT department's weird, they also have a hosted version you can use as well. Yes? It has excellent video chat, but maybe you have to pay for it? Yeah, you do have to pay for it now. Um, it also does a lot of integrations, so you can have, um, it hooks into almost everything. So if you have like a, a, a GitHub issue tracker, um, or if you have like ticket requests that are coming in, you can actually sync in HipChat, and it, it, they have canned integrations for those systems. So if, as like tickets are getting opened up, it can actually be sending pings to your chat room and say, hey, new support ticket opened up, go look at it on, uh, on GitHub issues or Jira or whatever it is that you're using. It's an XMPP Jabber protocol, so you can tie it to the 
Chat? Hip chat. No. It's by the guys who make Jira. Uh, Walmart. Uh, yes. And a recent competitor is Slack. Yeah, Slack. Yeah, Slack, yeah, Slack is good too. Now we have dozens of silos we can talk to. Yes. All right. Well, thanks everybody. My slides are. Uh,